Hi, I'm Patrick Scott. Welcome back to PLS 101, American Democracy and Citizenship. We're going to continue our discussion today about federalism uh, and some different aspects that uh, we want to talk about and emphasize today. First of all, we're going to talk about how federalism has evolved over time. And uh, so we've, we'll go back to this, the early days in terms of how the founders of our country viewed federalism and how that has, the concept of, of federalism has evolved since then. The founders came away with different views of what federalism should really mean. After all, we had just created a brand new form of government and the founding fathers really didn't know exactly what was likely to happen in terms of how our system would evolve and the relationships between the national versus the, the, the state governments. There were some, like Hamilton, who looked at federalism to mean a system where the national government was supreme. Hamilton thought that we had to have a strong national government, it should be superior, and it should be the leading force, and that its powers were to be broadly construed. What he was arguing for, essentially, was something that the text calls nation-centered federalism. He was, of course, a federalist uh, in terms of his political party affiliation. Thomas Jefferson, by contrast, thought that the federal government should have very limited powers he argued more for power residing at the state level. He was calling for and articulating something more along the lines of a, something called a state-centered form of federalism. After all, he was an anti-federalist. So the term anti-federalist goes hand in hand with state-centered federalism. Um, and again, state-centered federalism is sort of like the idea of a confederation. It's a little bit stronger than a confederation in terms of the national government, but not much more than that. So we had, back when we had the, de the debate between the Federalist versus the Anti-Federalist, when they were talking about the relative power of the national government, there was that debate between nation-centered federalism versus state-centered federalism. Well, so how did those views uh, play out and which prevailed over time? One of the first and most important decisions came in 1819 with the Supreme Court decision in McCulloch versus Maryland. As you may recall in our discussion on the Constitution, this involved basically two issues. The first issue was, does Congress have the right to establish a national bank? And the second issue was, does Maryland, the state of Maryland, have the right to tax a branch of this bank if that bank is on Maryland soil? And so, essentially, McCulloch versus Maryland was a very important court case because the Supreme Court decided then that first of all, it, 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 as you may re remember, it affirmed the legitimacy of implied powers. Chief Justice John Marshall said that, that Congress did have the right to establish a national bank because the national bank would be part of the implied powers that goes along with Congress's responsibility to uh, regulate commerce and, 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 and thereby the economy. Um, the second component of this, and this is why it's also a very important court case, and we talk about it in the context of federalism, involves the issue of Maryland. Did Maryland have the right to tax an entity of this federal government? And in this case, the Supreme Court said that Maryland did not have the right to tax this branch because it would set the states up as being more powerful than the national government. So one of the, uh, the importance of McCulloch versus Maryland was that it not only expanded the powers of Congress through implied powers, but it also affirmed the supremacy of the federal government over the states. Uh, so this case was a very important case early on in terms of establishing uh, the le legitimacy of the national government, and it also was a case that affirmed the idea of, of a nation-centered federalism over a state-centered federalism. Okay. Now, during the 1800s, our country was trying to figure out the balance between the power of the federal government and the power of the states. And then, interestingly, in early 1800s, 1824, there was another important court case called Gibbons versus Ogden. And basically, the Supreme Court said that the state of New York did not have the right to pass a law that simply that gave a monopoly to uh, a company in New York. Basically, it dealt with a shipping company in New York, a monopoly as shipping goods between New York and um, New Jersey because basically that became a matter of interstate commerce and the Supreme Court in Gibbons versus Ogden said essentially that that state law was unconstitutional. 
uh, because it should be Congress and thereby the national government that's responsible for carrying out and, and governing matters of interstate commerce and not at the state level. So we see through Gibbons versus Ogden and also through McCulloch versus Maryland how this, these two cases help to affirm the supremacy of the national government over the states. But nonetheless, let's not forget though, there was a still a very strong anti-federal sentiment throughout our country during that time. And even today, we still see a very strong anti underlying anti-federalist sentiment. Even today, there are a lot of people today who believe very strongly along the lines of Thomas Jefferson of limited government at the national level and uh, more power at the state and local level. Okay, so that, again, that's, sort of, that's an undercurrent that runs through our, our blood as, as a political system. Well, anyway, during the 1800s, uh, there are many people who believed more along, clearly more along the lines of Jefferson, arguing for a state form of state-centered form of federalism. Despite what the Supreme Court said, there are many people belong, be, who believe very strongly in the idea of states' rights. And so, so this concept of states' rights and, st and people known as states' writers became very prominent in the 1800s. There were some people who believed so passionately about the rights of states that they believed that they could declare a federal law as invalid if they thought that somehow that federal law violated the Constitution. And this became known as the doctrine of nullification. And again, the doctrine of nullification says that states have the right to declare a federal law, quote, null and void, end quote, if they believe that that federal law violates the Constitution. This doctrine of nullification was articulated in the mid-1800s by John C. Calhoun of South Carolina. He argued that the federal government should not prevent states from allowing slavery. In his view, the states had the right to allow slavery. After all, slavery was allowed for in the Constitution. And so therefore, if the federal government attempted to ban slavery, Calhoun made the argument that states had the right to nullify such a law. If the Constitution allows it, if the Constitution speaks to it, the federal government is the one that's in violation of the Constitution, therefore the states have the right to essentially declare that law null and void, essentially meaning that they have the right to ignore that law. He argued that the states could nullify such a law because it would be an unconstitutional infringement upon the state's right of sovereignty. So what I think is important for you to understand is that this doctrine of nullification, what it implies, Think about this. If the states have the right to declare a federal law null and void because it doesn't conform to the Constitution, then what does that suggest about the role of the states as being the interpreters of the Constitution? Who should be the final interpreter of the Constitution? The states, the federal government, the Supreme Court, or I should say the states, the Congress of the Supreme Court. The doctrine of nullification basically suggests that the states become the final arbiter or interpreter of the Constitution. In a lot of ways, the states, the, the whole idea of the doctrine of nullification gives states the rights to be more powerful than the Supreme Court. In a lot of ways, the doctrine of nullification stands Marbury versus Madison on its head because Marbury versus Madison affirmed the right of the Supreme Court to engage in judicial review. That was passed back in 1803, or rendered back in 1803. The Supreme Court made that decision, and that basically affirmed the legitimacy of the Supreme Court to be the final arbiter of the Constitution. The doctrine of nullification basically invalidates that idea, and basically says that almost as if the states have the right to engage in judicial review, not the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court affirmed the right of judicial review, a meaning that, the final, that, that it is the final arbiter of the Constitution. And by the way, in elevating the states over the Supreme Court is tantamount to elevating the states over the federal government. And as you know, this whole issue of doctor, the doctrine of nullification was eventually settled by a war, the Civil War. The Union victory put an end to this doctrine. The states could not declare acts of Congress unconstitutional. Only the Supreme Court could do this. Now, after the Civil War to about 1933 or so, another doctrine began to emerge called dual federalism. So we had nation-centered federalism and state-centered federalism playing out 
uh, and, and elements of that playing out, but nation-centered federalism became dominant. But after uh, the war, uh, beginning especially in the, in the late 1800s, we begin to see another doctrine emerge called dual federalism. And this is the idea that the national and state governments are equal but independent partners. Each has their own separate spheres of authority. Each should not interfere with the work or the affairs of the other. The two spheres of government, that is the state and the national government, should and could be kept sec separate so that there would be no conflict. After the Civil War, the Supreme Court declared in a series of rulings that various kinds of economic activities, fishing, mining, banking, manufacturing, a lot of it, again, economic in nature, were not subject to federal regulation, but instead could be regulated under the police powers of the individual states. So again, this is when you begin to see, and as we were growing, our economy was beginning to grow, uh, more of this idea of dual federalism taking place. Now, interestingly, things changed quite a bit around 1933. Power shifted substantially to Washington, precipitated, of course, by the Great Depression of 1929. Uh, there was uh, one of the reasons for the growth of and power of the national government was a conviction that um, we needed to have some ways to strengthen our economy and perform functions that the states really could not perform on their own. With the Great Depression and the unemployment that came about through the Great Depression, it revealed a lot of weaknesses of what happens when you have a highly unregulated economic system throughout our nation. It changed the public's views. The Great Depression changed the public's views of what should be the desirable role of the federal government. And it created public pressure to protect people from economic catastrophe. So we had, for example, in 1932, we elected uh, a, a, a new president, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, FDR, and he proposed as a basis for his platform, elect me and uh, I'll help put America back to work. And he proposed to America a new deal. And again, as you saw, there, was, there were bread lines, the economy had, had, had uh, the unemployment was something about over, uh, on average, 25 percent, and even more than that in some places. So jobs were very, very hard to find, bread lines were long, poverty was rampant, um, people were losing their mortgages, and it really did change people's views about this. Uh, you may have uh, some relatives, some great-grandparents or grandparents who grew up during the, the Depression, uh, I had, my parents were growing up during the Depression, and I can see even how in some of them how the Depression really had a major effect in terms of how they look at things today, in fact. Um, my mother-in-law, for example, will not waste anything because she had her, her farm was taken away during the Depression. And so even today, every little scrap of paper that she gets, she holds on to until we go and clean it out. I want to go visit her because she will just not, you know, she just believes that everything can be used for a purpose. And I think in a lot of ways, her, her mentality was, was, was a, a function, was, was, was very much formed by the experience that she endured during, during the Great Depression. But under the New Deal, Franklin Delano Roosevelt basically said that if you elect me, I will, I, will, I will provide a New Deal to the people. And under that program, set of programs, he set up a social security system that we still have today unemployment insurance, a welfare system, whereby the federal and the state governments worked jointly together. So under the New Deal, which basically sparked a dramatic increase of growth of government at the national level to regulate the economy, to get people to work, we have, for example, the Civilian Conservation Corps, the Works Progress Administration. A lot of new agencies were developed during this time to regulate the economy and to get people back to work. And uh, during that period of time, we see uh, an era marked by something called cooperative federalism. It's no longer dual federalism, but in this case it was a state and federal governments working together, cooperating to help alleviate some of these very significant conditions across our, our country. So, during this time, the federal government began to take an increasingly active role because of the, of the Depression. But over time, something else was beginning to happen as well that further increased the role and the scope and the authority of the national government that, and therefore the federal government began to become more and more involved. Over the next several decades, there was this escalating perception that the states were performing badly in many key areas, especially in, in the areas of civil rights. 
By the late 1950s and early 1960s, many states had come to be seen as perpetrators of discrimination. You saw, for example, some of the, the movement for, toward civil rights for African Americans, um, the, the, and, and you saw the demonstrations uh, being uh, quelled by riot police turning on water hoses and dogs to prevent African Americans from organizing and protesting about uh, their, their rights. Um, governors at the time had many, many of the governors had weak powers. The state legislatures were small and not very well organized. They were very unprofessionalized as well. Uh, they were only meeting a few weeks out of the year, not paying much of their legislators. So you had very, very small, limited government, weak government at the state levels, and they were not able to, to uh, uh, reverse some of these, these trends, particularly at the local level. So people began to call upon the federal government to play an increasingly active role in trying to alleviate poverty and also enhance civil rights. So we see during the, particularly during the 60s and the 1970s, people began to call on Washington for help. And thus began the era of fiscal federalism from basically the 1960s on. During this time, the federal government said, well, one of the ways in which we can deal with some of these issues is by providing more money and more assistance and, uh, to, to the, the state and local governments. And so during the 60s and the 70s, there was a huge growth in federal grants to states and cities. And the result, because of that, there were more than 400 different kinds of programs with very detailed rules and formulas and bureaucracies associated with that to carry out these programs. Uh, we began to see, for example, in 1965, the creation of the Department of Housing and Urban Development, helping to alleviate homelessness and, and inner city poverty. Uh, other, other agencies began to form. There's the Department of Health, Education, and Welfare uh, that was formed, that, uh, that was subsequently replaced by the Department of Health and Human Services, uh, but that was in, in, involved in providing uh, several types of grants to states uh, in terms of, um, of um, Medicaid and Medicare. Uh, programs that, that, be, that became law and passed in the 1960s. So we saw this increasing level of growth in terms of money being provided to the states. By 2001, federal grants amounted to over $300 billion per year and were spent through over 400 separate programs. And that was actually more than double what had been spent even in the 1990s. But basically how all this works is as follows. There's a, there's a program that Washington would create as well as the bureaucracy to administer this program. And Washington would pay the bills while the states would maybe run the programs it, as the money would flow to lower levels of government. And the states, of course, welcomed that because, for example, if Alabama could get the federal government to put up money for improving, say, the Port of Mobile, the citizens of the nation, not just Alabama, would be paying for it. And at, the lo at local governments, uh, they were becoming so dependent on federal money that they were, become, they were being called quote, federal aid junkies. In fact, in 1978 in Detroit, over three-fourths of its revenue was coming directly from Washington. And again, with the idea of trying to alleviate poverty in the inner city. Um, today we have, if we're talking about fiscal federalism, uh, it's good to talk about two different kinds of broad categories of grant programs. The two most important, there are actually several, but the two most important types of grants are categorical grants and block grants. Now the text talks also about project grants and formula grants, and both of those can be subsumed within uh, categorical grants or block grants. So let me just talk about the, the two major ones here first. Categorical grants are by, by, by far the largest categories. Categorical grants are used uh, for a specific purpose. They are defined by federal law. Here's a grant to build an airport. Here's a grant for, to build college dormitories. Here's a grant for highways. Here's a grant for senior citizen housing complex. Okay. Interesting, Medicaid and food stamps are also uh, ca categorical grants. These types of grants are very specific for, for specific use for a very specific purpose. They um, generally require the state or locality to put up matching funds. And again, there's a lot of strings attached with that, uh, attached to that money. And I'll give you an example of that. We talked about highways. Uh, funding for interstate highways uh, is often uh, tied, some strings associated with that have been tied to drinking age laws. Um, at one time, uh, funding for highways was also tied to states imposing a 55 mile per hour limit. Many years ago, 
Um, there was no, uh, states could have their own, f own speed limit and then the federal government imposed a 55 mile per hour all the way through. And uh, that, was, that was actually the law back in the 1970s and early 80s. And the states were required to reduce their speed limit because a lot of research had showed that reduced speed limits re lead to fewer fatalities. And so all the states were mandated to lower their speed limits to 55 miles per hour. And the way the federal government required that for the states was saying, if you don't conform to this, we're going to take away your highway funds. So you see how the funding was tied. There's some strings attached to that funding. And then back in the 90s, there was another issue related to highway funding, that was drinking age. This, the federal government required all states to raise their minimum age from 18 to 21. And they said to the states, if you choose not to, then we're going to take away your highway funds. And it was, uh, many states quickly conformed to that requirement because there's a lot of money that comes away in the way of federal dollars for highways. And the states were very eager to ensure that the flow of money continued. Um, nonetheless, under these categorical grants, because they are specific, because they often require matching funds, and because there are often strings attached to it, the states tend to complain that these grants do not give them enough flexibility in terms of how to spend the money. So, um, because of that, uh, in response to these concerns, there's been a shift toward block grants. And this is essentially where a block grant is when you consolidate several categorical grants into one that's more general in nature. And a very famous one, for example, that's administered by the Department of Housing and Urban Development is something called uh, the Community Development Block Grant, CDBG. Uh, but it may be community development, health care, social services, but again, the CDBG, the Community Development Block Grant, is a very famous example of a, of a block grant. And basically, uh, what the block grants do is it gives the cities and states more flexibility in terms of how they spend the money. Instead of saying, we're going to be using this for a specific purpose, we're going to be doing this in terms of community development. Community development may mean a senior citizen center. It might be, mean a, a new recreation center for young people. It might mean a new park or anything like that in the, in the name of community development. So the idea behind this, the block grants was to give states and local governments more flexibility. There are still re requirements attached to it, but still more flexibility in terms of how they spent that money. Um, so the states, of course, welcomed that. And with the move toward devolution, I mentioned 1994 is a good example of of the, the uh, contract with America and, and the emphasis on devolution of responsibilities from the federal to the state governments. That whole idea of devolution goes hand in hand with this idea of the rise of block grants. Um, block grants and devolution go hand in hand. You've got more state responsibilities, more things being performed at the state and local level, give them more flexibility at the same time by having more and more block grants. So those two, the, the number and rise of block grants increased in, in proportion to the emphasis on devolution. But nonetheless, I will also say, so that we keep things in perspective here, that categorical grants are still by far the much larger category of grants in which the federal government administers aid to state and local governments. So we've got categorical grants, we've got block grants. The two others I wanted to mention to you that's uh, worth talking about just briefly here is the idea of um, uh, project grants and formula grants. Project grants are can be subsumed specifically within a category or, or block grants, but basically it's for a specific project. So you can apply for CDBG funds for a specific project. And so you're saying, I want to use this grant for this project, and you make an application for it. The state or local government will make an application for that, and then the federal government will say, yes, this will fit under, the, under, under uh, CDBG guidelines, and so therefore you can use it for that purpose. But it's tied to a specific project. And then a formula grant is something that is tied to basically a, 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 a set of formulas uh, or, or, or indices or, or variables that may change from one locale to the other and the money you get is based upon these kinds of uh, variables. And let me give you an example of a formula grant. Um, for a long time, there was something called general revenue sharing and, as, and general revenue sharing is uh, no longer in place. But it was basically money given to states, uh, I'm sorry, to cities, that were basically, that they didn't have to apply for, it was just money that the federal government, a pot of money that the federal government gave to the cities. And it ranked order the cities from poorest to the wealthiest. And essentially, the poorest cities got more per capita than the wealthier cities. 
And the reason why is because it said, you know, we look at various conditions of your city. We look at things about, for example, your housing. What's the quality of your housing in your city? What's the average age of your housing stock? Uh, how, how dilapidated is your housing? What's the percentage of people in your, in your city that are homeless, What's your homeless population? What are, are the percentage of children who are in schools who are receiving free and reduced lunch and part of that program? So they look at measures of poverty and the other kinds of things, and then based upon these, natu you know, these, these, these naturally occurring statistics, uh, cities would get uh, or, uh, the, the, a certain amount of money, poor cities getting more than the wealthier cities. Um, it was a program that was popular, f of course, for many cities, but it also generated a lot of controversy. A lot of mayors fought over these kinds of things because some mayors would say, we're not getting enough money from the federal government because um, you're not factoring in certain conditions of our city that ought to be part of this formula. And so there's a lot of intense political debate that took place over the, over the general revenue sharing. Uh, Reagan, uh, interestingly, Nixon started the program. Reagan got rid of the program because he just thought it made the f cities too dependent upon the, the federal government. But nonetheless, I'll bring that up because even this program that we don't use now, it embodied that idea of a formula concept. And we do have some other grants that are part of categorical grants and part of block grants that employ a kind of formula like that as a basis for the application. So uh, those are the different kinds of, of grants um, that we, we do have. Now, um, I would also say too, uh, what's interestingly in terms of recent changes in, in welfare reform, is you may go back to President Clinton, he said that we're going to end welfare as we know it. And we go back again to the contract with America uh, in 1994. Well, um, during the late 1990s, um, we moved away, in terms of welfare reform, we moved away from a categorical grant, AFDC, Aid to Families with Dependent Children, to something called TANF, the Temporary Assistance to Needy Families. So TANF was a block grant that replaced AFDC. And the block grant in welfare reform gave states more flexibility and more discretion in terms of how they spent the money to administer the funds. And so, for example, there was a, like a, a, a work requirement associated with some of these uh, funds. You had to find a job. Uh, you had to go through training as part of this to the idea of getting people off of welfare. And some of them even had like a five-year cap in terms of total amount of uh, time that you could be on or receive these funds. And after that, you were off, even if you didn't have a job. But again, it gave the, uh, it, it, it was a fundamental change from a categorical program to a uh, block program, and it was a good example of that idea of devolution in play, giving the states more responsibility and more flexibility, and moving a major categorical program to a block grant kind of format. Now, again, I still mention the point, and let me emphasize that even though we've seen that movement toward block grants, categorical grants are still the major type of grant. And the reason why is because there are clearly identifiable clients and interest groups that are tied to these grants. And when we're talking about pluralism, we're talking about the idea of the, the, the importance of joining a group and, and, and having your voices heard through the group and the group leaders as a way of influencing our system. And under a pluralist model of government, you can look at government as being a broker of competing interest. And so, when you have clearly identifiable clients um, who are expressing a desire for these funds and wanting to curry their political favor, you know, then that goes part and parcel with the, um, a categorical grant. So in other words, categorical grants are still very, very powerful because we have a dominant pluralist system in our government. And as long as we have a dominant pluralist system in our government, Categorical grants will always be, be stronger and probably more dominant than the block grants would be as well because they, they tend to go hand in hand. Now, interestingly, <clears throat> a lot of texts don't really talk about this, and, uh, but I, I think also it's important to talk about in terms of federalism and fiscal federalism is this. One of the interesting side effects of fiscal federalism has led to an increased level of bureaucracy at the state, local, and federal levels. And think about this. If the federal government sets up a pot of money to give, to dole it out to state and local governments, how do you make sure that that money is spent appropriately? If you just give the money out and don't put the controls in place, there's going to be abuse of taxpayer dollars, wasted spending 
and maybe fraud in some cases as well. So how do you make sure that, that you're protecting the taxpayer's interest to, and, and taxpayer dollars, making sure their, their dollars are being spent well, appropriately, for the purpose of, as of which those grants are intended? Well, the way you have to do that is by setting up controls. Well, how do you set up controls? Well, that basically means you've got to hire auditors, people who are maybe involved in creating computer information systems to track the flow of money or financial systems. Um, you've got to basically set up programs specifically to, with guidelines and criteria for showing and, and demonstrating how this money is to be used. So you have to set up bureaucracy, essentially, programs and government agencies at the federal level to monitor and track and create compliance conditions and to, to develop policies to determine how that money is to be spent and to also track the degree to which that money is actually being spent the way it's intended. So basically what you're doing here is the minute you set up a pot of money to be spent at a different level, you've got to create federal agencies, that is federal bureaucracy, to monitor, to track the flow of money and to make sure that the policies are being followed. Well then, that money goes from the federal government to the states. What happens at the state level? The very same thing. You're going to have to create bureaucracy at the state level as well to basically monitor the flow of funds to, say, local governments, to set up compliance conditions, to track the funds, to make sure it's being spent appropriately. So you hire accountants, auditors, computer information systems specialists, financial management specialists, uh, financial systems analysts, <coughs> excuse me, all sorts of different individuals and, and programs and agencies designed to create, designed to track this, this, this flow of funds. And then at the local level, the recipients, They've got to hire people who are able to, to spend the money the appropriate way, to document their compliance with it, to send reports back up to the state capital, Jefferson City, or to Washington, D.C., uh, to, to, to demonstrate how they have complied with the requirements of the grant. So what I'm trying to suggest to you is what you're doing here is you're setting up bureaucracy at every single step of the process. You're increasing bureaucracy at the federal level, you're increasing bureaucracy at the state and the local level. And so because of that, all the compliance officials and everything else, you've got to do, to do that. In the process, the cumulative effect of that is more bureaucracy and more red tape. A lot of people complain about big bureaucracy and big red tape. Well, a big source of the bureaucracy and the red tape that we see at the state and federal level is because of these grant programs. Well-intentioned programs that are designed to help alleviate poverty. Unfortunately, if you don't follow the money and track the money through bureaucracy, then you're going to have abuse of that money. And so in a lot of ways you can see that as a being uh, abusive and wasteful spending, but if you don't have anyone to track the money, you're definitely, I can guarantee you that that money will not be spent for the intended purposes. As I've heard one famous scholar say about red tape, one person's red tape is somebody else's proce treasured procedural safeguard. One person's red tape is somebody else's accountability system built into place. So, I know a lot of times people blame big government and big bureaucracy and all this red tape that they may see, but I want you to understand that bureaucracy and red tape really has a purpose. And to the extent that you have more abuse of how money is spent, what that suggests, ironically enough, is more red tape, if you will, more bureaucracy to track and make sure that money is spent appropriately. The other al alternative is to have no money being spent in those areas at all, but then if you don't have money being spent in these areas, what does that do? It exacerbates the conditions maybe of poverty or other kinds of economic conditions for which those grants were intended to begin with. So I just want you to understand that that's a very interesting side effect of fiscal federalism. The minute you have well-intentioned ideas that get implemented, you've got to have bureaucracy and red tape to go along with that. Okay, there are a few other concepts I want to talk about and then we'll wrap up our discussion on federalism. Um, one of the, there have been several scholars that have looked at federalism and they've come up with different kinds of analogies and, and ways of looking at federalism. And I've heard uh, federalism described as a marble cake, a layer cake, a picket fence. Let me just uh, describe to you some of these ideas and what we mean by that. Um, the very simplest is this idea of a layer cake. A layer cake, as you know in terms of how it looks, you've got three, maybe three different levels. You've got the local level, You've got the state level and the federal level. And so, to some scholars, uh, our system of federalism looks like a layer cake with three different levels and basically very, very clear distinctions and functions among all the levels. Some people have made the argument that, no, that's not a very good model of looking at federalism. Instead, uh, we should look at federalism as a series of picket fences. And the idea behind that 
is that if with each, each you've got, with a, think about what a picket fence looks like. You've got the vertical and the horizontal. And the vertical would be the different levels of government, the federal, state, and local, but the horizontal would be uh, different kinds of policy areas. And so you've got uh, one policy for, you know, for one slat and another policy for the other slat. But the idea of that there being a lot of intermingling among the different levels uh, uh, across different kinds of programs in, in, in terms of intergovernmental relations. And, and, um, and, and then yet another analogy is this idea of a marble cake. So instead of a layer cake, you've got a marble cake. And a marble cake, as you know, has, uh, you know, you know the, the, the way it looks is you've got, the, the, the connotation here is that you've got federal, federal authority intermixing with state and local authority. And at some point it's hard to tell where does the federal authority begin and end, where does the state authority begin and end, where does the local authority begin and end. And I'll give you an example of that. Let's say you have a teacher who is, uh, basically working in a Head Start program. Now that teacher may be working for a local school district and paid for by local school district funds, but their, that person's salary uh, might be supplemented by the state government and the federal government. The federal government may actually have some kind of special program designed uh, for enhancing teachers and training teachers in terms of Head Start education. And so the idea here is that you don't know, does this, does therefore this teacher, does he or she report to their local government or the state government? I mean, is this person really an employee of the state government or the federal government or local uh, government? And that's the idea behind this uh, notion of this marble cake kind of, kind of uh, federalism. And in another way too, you can look at marble cake in, in this way. In the U.S., think about this, we have 50 states, but we have 3,000 or so counties, thousands of more municipalities, and tens of thousands of authorities. Uh, what I mean by authorities, for example, a public housing authority, um, a uh, school districts, a water authority, a port authority. These are local governments that transcend and cross boundary lines. They may cross local government lines, city lines, state and county lines even. And all of these authorities may have some say or control over what you do. The school district and Springfield School District is like this as well. Uh, it has, it, there are taxes that go along with, with that, and it has a right, you, you're paying taxes to the school district. But you have these local authorities, you have, again, the counties, you have the states, you have the federal government, and so because of this whole variety, you, they're, in a lot of ways, they're intermingled in terms of their functions and their requirements and their activities, and so they, all of these have some kind of control over what you say or, 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 or what you do. I shouldn't say some, some, what you say, but it has some control or some say over what you do. And so the idea here is that sovereignty is shared broadly across all these kinds of overlapping districts of government. And so that's the idea here of sort of why I think perhaps that federalism is very adequately described according to this kind of marble cake kind of theory. It's not some neatly layered kind of thing where you have different levels, but actually a lot of intermingling and shared and overlapping functions that are performed at each, at each level. Uh, another important thing to understand in terms of federalism is, this, is an idea of called unfunded mandates. An unfunded mandate is almost self-explanatory. This is basically where the federal government passes laws requiring the states to do a certain thing or a certain kind of activity, but does not provide the adequate money to, for them to do it. Uh, a very famous example of this would be uh, the Americans with Disabilities Act of 1990. This act passed by Congress required businesses and state and local governments to provide those who are physically challenged with equal access to services, to employment, access to buildings and transportation systems. Um, so for example, city buses must now be accessible to those who, have, uh, who are disabled, such as by providing wheelchair lifts. Um, you have to make sure, for example, I remember seeing throughout the time uh, here in Missouri State, a massive undertaking of some capital improvements of, and refurbishing of old buildings. And one of the things that I remember seeing even here on campus is how uh, the, the, the Missouri State, under the requirement of the ADA, putting in elevators, new elevators in some old buildings where before there were only stairs, they were putting in, in elevators to do this. And it's interesting because before the ADA in some old campus buildings, uh, it's kind of interesting what different universities would used to do. And I remember, for example, when I was receiving my, uh, obtaining my master's degree from the University of Georgia, uh, my department was in a very old building. It's one of the oldest buildings on campus, a very stately kind of building, a beautiful building, but it had no elevators in it. It just had stairs going up and down. It's about a four or five story building. 
And um, for people who were in wheelchairs, how, how did they get to camp? How did they get to class? Back then, what they would do is hire student workers to basically transport people in wheelchairs up and down the stairs. Because in their view at the time, that was cheaper than building elevators. I mean, despite the sense of loss of di some dignity, I guess, on the part of those who were in the wheelchair, um, but it was just, I remember seeing people going up and down, um, carrying four people carrying a person in a wheelchair up and down stairs. And I remember thinking about how much that contrasts so much with the ADA requirements of today. today. And of course, with the University of Georgia, they have put elevators since that time you know, in, in that particular building. But again, you, uh, unfunded mandates, a lot of this, that was a good example because uh, many states and local governments were required to provide these kinds of accommodations, but Congress was not providing the money to back it up in terms of helping them. A more recent example that some people consider to be an, an unfunded mandate is this idea that came about an educational policy under George W. Bush administration called No Child Left Behind. And under No Child Left Behind, requiring states to provide, you know, to, to uh, hold them accountable for making sure that, that children with uh, having struggling provide them uh, additional resources to help bring them up so that no one would be left behind in the cracks, so to speak. A lot of people thought that some of the requirements under No Child Left Behind was tantamount to an unfunded mandate because the federal government, the Department of Education, would mandate certain requirements on schools, for example, making adequate yearly progress, a term called AYP, and, and uh, withdraw or hold, withdraw funds or suspend funds for those schools if, they, if the schools could not demonstrate that those students who were behind were not making adequate yearly progress. And a lot of the school districts began to complain, saying they needed so much more money to help some of the students, particularly those who have special needs, to bring them up to a certain level of thresholds of performance. And uh, whereas the federal government would, would say, I'm sorry, this is all the money that you're going to get. So I remember seeing with, the, with a No Child Left Behind, uh, a lot of controversy and frustration of, among state and local officials, uh, citing that one as an example of a uh, of an unfunded mandate. Um, again, because of the unfunded mandates, there have been and complaints about that. There were, uh, Congress did pass in 1995 the Unfunded Mandates Reform Act. And basically what it said was that any new mandates must have the money to go along with it. But again, sometimes it still hasn't been forthcoming in terms of those mandates. The money has not been forthcoming. What I think is interesting, and, and, and this, this pretty much sums up our discussion on federalism, but before we go away, what I'd like for you to think about, and I think this is a very useful exercise, is this. What if we were to go back to the days of the Articles of Confederation? What if we had decided that instead of having a federal system or a unitary system, we would have had continued on with the Articles of Confederation, we would have had a confederal system where we allowed basically all the power to reside with the states. The question is, what do you think our society would look like today? What would our country look like today if we had, had maintained throughout our history very, very limited, weak, ineffectual national government? Would it be a better place to live today? Would it be better than perhaps what some people say today is a very big and intrusive federal government? Because the, the, the story as it evolved showed that the federal government became greater in size and scope and authority and responsibility and sovereignty than the states did. The states are still very powerful. The states still have the 10th Amendment. But the states, by contrast, are much weaker than the federal government. What if we had never had that growth of the federal government, but instead growth of the states? What would have happened? Would we have had perhaps some states having formal alliances with different countries overseas? Um, it's, be, it's just interesting to see. Will we have different uh, 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 currency um, from one country to another? It would just be interesting to, uh, from one state to another. It would just be very interesting to see how, how our system might look very different from that. But I think if nothing else, so I think what this underscores in light of all the different complexities that are faced and challenges that face our country today, the federal government would certainly be remiss if it did not take advantage of the innovation, the capabilities, the resources, the capacity that state governments have to offer. In many cases, there are certainly many responsibilities 
that the federal government could turn over to the states. And I think as the states have become, state governments have become increasingly professionalized, increasingly responsible, and by the way, increasingly bureaucratic. That's part of it. But as, they, as, the, as governments have grown at the state level, then certainly there are many functions that they, they could continue to perform. And so I think if, if nothing else, the time and the challenges for the today speak to the need for even greater cooperation between the federal government or the national government and the states to solve problems of mutual interest. And I'm hoping, it's my hope that we, we as to having conflict, we have much more cooperation than even up to this point. This concludes our discussion of federalism, and also this concludes our discussion of basically the first unit of material. The first unit basically talked about certain basic foundations of our government, democracies, different kinds of democracies. We talked about the Constitution. We talked about uh, various aspects of our Constitution, um, and uh, then our discussion, of course, here on federalism. Um, so this marks the end of that unit material discussion. When we move on next, we're going to move in the next several chapters. We'll talk about different types of political behavior. We'll think, talk about things like political parties, campaigns, elections, things like that. So until then, this is Patrick Scott signing off. Thank you.